jump in when they can. Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. Today's topic is all about the Bill of Rights. And my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'll be here with you today as your guide as we go through. If you have questions, feel free to open that chat. We love questions. So ask away, you can use the chat or the q and I'm here with one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center, Nick Osvick. Nick, you wanna say hi to everybody? Hi everyone. So Nick is super excited because we're gonna start with a Kahoot. So let's pull that up right now. We love games. I'm gonna start it. There's gonna be music and I will screen share in one second gang so you can see the Kahoot and be able to log in. So let me do that right now as we go through. Let's just do full screen share. Nope, Perry has to hit the right button. So this is the problem. <laughs> Can you hear it though? Nick, can you hear the beautiful music? <laughs> I've not heard anything yet. Oh, you're not? Oh, okay, students, mm -hmm. the Kahoot that you are gonna be playing today, is you can go to kahoot.it if you can, and your pin number is 227-4933. So if you want to play today, I see Milo is in the room. Um, you can join in the Kahoot. Let's get some competition. There we go. And then we'll get started. And students, if you can't log into the Kahoot, don't worry, I will read the questions and you can answer them in the chat. And Nick will keep an eye on the chat for me. Sounds good, Nick? I'm, I'm looking. What okay. music am I supposed to be hearing? Um, let me see if I can make the music play. <laughs> can you hear it now? I'm not hearing anything. No, no, no. Okay, I'll do one more thing and then we'll just, the students can hear it, but it's, it's fun. Oh, okay. uh, I just don't know, I didn't know what we were doing. I have to put that game pin in the chat. I'll, I'll okay. chat it. I'll chat it. So I officially make sure that we're recording and we're live streaming. So let's get started on our quiz. So our students, one more minute to join the Kahoot. Let's get rolling. If you can't do it, don't worry. You can answer in the chat. Okay, I'm going to wait till Tiffany's in. Nick, remember that number just in case the students ask for it in the chat. <laughs> I, I, I already chatted it. Okay, good. Thank you. You're a great assistant. <laughs> Okay, so Kahoot at work. Here we go. Bill of Rights trivia question. And students, this is all on that link that I gave you in the chat so you can play it later with your family and see if you can stump them. So let's make sure you can see this. The question is, how many amendments are in the Bill of Rights? Are there six, eight, 10, 12, or 15? If you can't answer in the Kahoot, don't worry. You can put it in the chat with Nick. We already have the answer in the chat. <laughs> yeah, well, don't worry. Don't answer it, Nick. <laughs> and very good. So for the students who picked 10, you are right. There's 10 amendments in the Bill of Rights. Next question. Next. Here we go. Who is the primary author of the Bill of Rights? So here's your option. Is it Thomas Jefferson? Is it Alexander Hamilton? Is it James Monroe? Or is it James Madison? And remember, don't worry through this in class today. And we will give everybody a chance to answer their question. It's, it's my oh. main man, James Madison. <laughs> Nick is Nick's got it for you. you Nick's main man, James Madison. That's right. <laughs> but we totally get why you would pick Thomas Jefferson. Nick, why do you think the students picked Thomas Jefferson? Well, he talked a lot about the Bill of Rights with James Madison. <laughs> they and had what is he many, really many letters. But the, the, well, what's that? What's he really known for writing? That's probably why. Well, wow, the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. Um, he so had not returned to the States quite yet. He was almost there to be Washington's Secretary of State when this Bill of Rights was being drafted, but uh, he could only communicate by letter with James Madison to push for what he thought was important. So he wanted one, but he didn't write it. And so students, you're probably thinking Declaration of Independence, which yeah. is a very good second guess on that one. But James Madison is right. Next question. Milo, you're still winning. <laughs> Which right isn't guaranteed in the First Amendment? Okay, so think of what's in the First Amendment is, uh, which one is not in there? So speech, press, assembly, and the right to bear arms, freedom to bear arms. So which one is not in the First Amendment? Very good job. Right to bear arms is the Second Amendment. Um, press and assembly and speech are all in the First Amendment as well as freedom of religion. 
Next question. I'm keeping and petition. Next. Don't miss. Don't oh, forget don't forget petition. petition. Sorry. No. I'm cruising along here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. What, this is for Nick and Scott. What is the third yes. amendment about? Soldiers occupying your home without your consent. That means you didn't let them and say it was okay. Your right to an attorney, right to privacy, or right to a trial by jury. And this one's a little tricky. Third Amendment, look at the, the hint. <laughs> Very good students. I mean, well, to be clear, I, I have an academic interest in the right to trial by jury. So that could have well been it for me too. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the image so the yes, yes. is about soldiers occupying your home without consent. Okay, next one. Ooh, Rory, Ooh, Rory so, taking the lead. Nice. It's about speed, people. It's about it speed is. as well. as Just like action. Jeopardy. It's really about how quickly you can hit that button. Totally. Does the original <laughs> Bill of Rights, sorry, does the original Bill of Rights protect your you against cruel and unusual forms of punishment? Is the answer yes or no? So somewhere in the Bill of Rights, is there something that says you cannot have cruel and unusual punishment? Yes or no? Ooh, split down the middle. Nick, tell us what amendment in the Bill of Rights protects you against cruel and unusual punishment. So that's the Eighth Amendment. We'll eighth get to amendment. talking a little bit more about that, but yes. <laughs> no, Curry wants to talk even more about that, so. I love the Eighth Amendment. It's really Keep... interesting. Okay, last one. Do oh, not last one. We have six more, four more to go. Double jeopardy, self-incrimination, due process are all parts of which amendment? This is a tricky one, but here's your hint. Please. The hint what. is the pr two previous questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the hint. Plead the... <laughs> Self-incrimination is when you don't have to speak out against yourself. So you're going to plead the what? Very good if you answered plead the fifth on that one. So yes, it is the fifth amendment that gives you double jeopardy self-incrimination. And we will talk about that more. I'm going to keep going. I'm just trying to give, give them that, that way of approaching tests going forward, yes, which is I always you have smart. to test and form your answers too. <laughs> yeah, look at what you've already been asked. The original Second Amendment wasn't ratified until 1791. It later became the 27th Amendment. So it's really this, uh, the second article became the 27th yes, yes. Amendment. Sorry, I'm gonna fix that. How long did that process take? Ooh, one person got it right. And this was a really hard question. It's 1992. Yeah. Yep, 203 years. So that original, the original amendment that would have been the second amendment was article two, technically wound up being ratified 203 years later. So that means those who answered one of those early questions about how many amendments were in the bill of rights and said 12, they were right in a small way, which was 12 amendments were in fact sent to the States, but two were rejected. I like that, Nick. Way to, go, way to add people back into the winner circle. <laughs> James uh, Madison's home um, state made the Bill of Rights official when it ratified it in 1791. <laughs> Which is James Madison's home state? New York and Connecticut, Virginia or Maryland? Where's Madison from? Nice job. Nice job if you answered Virginia. Maryland's a good guess too, but Virginia is the answer. Let's go see you. Drew is in the leaderboard, man. Next. Okay. Where is the original federal government copy of the Bill of Rights today? Hmm. Is it at the National Constitution Center? Is it in the Senate Rotunda? Is it at the National Archives and Records Administration in Washington, D.C.? Or is it in the Oval Office at the White House? Ooh, I don't even think I know the answer to this one. <laughs> Let's see who's right. Ooh, and the answer is at the National Archives in the Rotunda. And hopefully soon we'll all be able to get back there and see it or back there for the first time. Um, we do have a copy of the Bill of Rights at the National Constitution Center, but it isn't technically one of the original ones. It's one of the original ones that went to the state. So you know what? I'm going to give anybody that answered red and blue the correct answer. So that means you all get points for this one, at least in my book. Let's see. Depends yeah. on how you read that question. Exactly. That's being real active. And the word right. original is so hard. Mm. So the 10th yes. Amendment deals with the relationships between what? The Congress and the president, the federal government and the states, Supreme Court and the military, or the United States and Canada. So it's the 10th Amendment. What were they trying to spell out at the end of the Bill of Rights? The kind of, what relationship? Very good answers, everybody. The federal government and the states. That was a hard one. Good job. So Nick, we can go fast when we finally get to the 10th Amendment. <laughs> and I think this is the last question. 
there we go. The original Bill of Rights covers abuses by um, covered abuses by the national government, both the national and state governments, or just the state government. So who was it telling not to step on the individual and not to step on the people? Was it telling the states not to do that? Was it telling the national government not to do that? Or was it telling both? Very good. The answer is the national government. Congress shall make no law. That's how the First Amendment starts. And that's the theme of the Bill of Rights. Um, it, Tom Bingham answered orange, uh, though. Yes. So you are right. Good <laughs> point, Nick. So if you were thinking around the 14th Amendment and the Bill of Rights, then both would have been appropriate. Te yeah, technically, you know, there are some people who are arguing that, in fact, that that was already true under the original uh, conception of the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. So, so. Real quick, we're going through the winners. Despite the I, language. <laughs> I forgot to do this last time we had this class and I thought the students were going to choke me. Drew is the winner with a follow-up by um, Catherine, wow, Catherine that's close. and that's Rory, close. which let me get that right. Very good. Awesome. Okay, Nick, now we're ready to dive into class. That was a fun kahoot. Um, I'm gonna so open. should I still go through the text at this point? And now we've kind of got. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, the students have done such a great job that we can really dive into this pretty quickly and start with, I'm going to make this a lot smaller so you don't see my messy desktop. I <laughs> get overwhelmed. Um, we can really maybe start with what was the, why did the founding generation add a Bill of Rights? They had just started with the constitution and said, okay, we have a constitution, but why did they quickly add these bill of rights? And as you talk through that, Nick, I can show the students all the text of each of the amendments, but what's yeah. the big idea behind the bill of rights? Why did they add these? And clarify for us, they weren't added really as a package, they're added separately, but why did they wanna add these rights? So they just come out of the constitutional convention in 1787, and very quickly, they add a Bill of Rights. Why? You tell us that story, and I'll visually walk through these. Well, I mean, we should say that it is a package because they do send 12 amendments to the states, right? So they are putting them all together at once and sending them to the states. Um, and they do reject two, but we'll get to that process, right? So they do do that, right? It's just the degree to which people treat the Bill of Rights is one has to do with the reactions to the Bill of Rights by those who wanted it, which kind of gets us to our story of how we get there, right? So Bill of Rights already existed. That's the first point, right? Is uh, the English had forms of Bills of Rights going uh, back to the Magna Carta. Um, the Magna Carta is, a rec is arguably only a recognition of rights or privileges given by the king to uh, some of the lords. So it's degree to which it's recognizing the rights we think of is not really obvious, but by the 17th century, the English have both the Declaration of Rights and the English Bill of Rights, which falls from the um, uh, Glorious Revolution of 1688, in which essentially Parliament declared the abuses of the king against certain rights, right? And some of those were contended to be... Um, uh, natural rights. Uh, what are what are these? Some some of those rights are ones that we would recognize, right? Including the language for the Eighth Amendment that cruel and unusual punishment is in the English Bill of Rights. Um, so early forms of money of the important rights we think of that the founders tend to think were most important, right? They emphasize things like the right to trial by jury, um, uh, freedom of conscience in particular. Um, is being very, very important. Privileges, due process, which itself goes back to the Magna Carta. So the English had their forms. And then I know Curry doesn't like to talk state bill, uh, state I constitutions like too much, <laughs> but here it's more important in part because substantively it's very influential because when James Madison goes in 1789 to draft his proposed amendments, which he'll write a total of 17, actually. Um, he starts with the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which was written in June 1776. So Virginia actually had its constitution and declaration of rights just before the Declaration of Independence. And it was George Mason who wrote it. Now, we'll meet George Mason because he's one of those three dissenters who refused to sign the constitution in part because it didn't have a Bill of Rights. But he wrote that Virginia Declaration of Rights, uh, one of these early state constitutions, many early state constitutions had 
uh, bills of rights or declaration of rights, not all did, which will turn out to be important. Um, it wasn't a consensus, but a lot of states did this. And so Virginia, in the Declaration of Rights, again, there are analogs. When I say analogs, what I mean is they're not the same language as our Bill of Rights. If you go to the National Constitution Center's website, you can see, actually, we have a really neat way of tracking the state's Bills of Rights, the proposals to the final language. So you can make this comparison through a chart. Um, so they're not, it's not the same thing, but they are talking about what I just mentioned, right? We're talking about freedom of conscience. It, freedom of press is mentioned. Uh, petition is an old right, right? Petition is really important, actually. A due process, um, uh, early versions of the right to bear arms, um, uh, early versions of the Fourth Amendment, the right against uh, search and seizure, uh, all those things are in there. And yes, the, uh, the right to a trial by jury is considered uh, pretty fun fundamental. So it, it's, it's giving a blueprint, basically. Think of it that way, students, that it's, this is a blueprint. The, a couple others are, we get to that convention in 1787, why don't they put in a Bill of Rights? It gets to the heart of this debate over whether or not we need a Bill of Rights, right? So it does actually come up at the Constitutional Convention. When we talked last week about the convention, Curry, I think over and over again said, hey, remember it's a hot, long summer. I remind us of this because the debate over a Bill of Rights doesn't happen really until the last week. So by this point, they are settled a lot of the big issues. They've been doing this for a while. They're ready to sign the thing and, and present it, right? They're, they're ready to be done. And it's George Mason, it's Edmund Randolph, it's Elbridge Gerry, who they're, the three dissenters are the ones who are saying, no, 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 let's, let's talk a bill of, about a Bill of Rights. Let's have this debate now. You know, we really need one of these to actually pass this. And uh, they do push for it over and over again, um, but nothing happens because uh, their colleagues are essentially exhausted. They don't wanna have a protracted debate about a Bill of Rights. And many of them, as we'll see, frankly feel like we don't need a Bill of Rights. Uh, so it doesn't happen. Those three don't sign the constitution that gets submitted to the states and Mason makes it clear, Gary makes it clear. One of our problems here is there's no Bill of Rights. They have other issues too, but they think the constitution has too much power over state governments, but they're complaining about a lack of Bill of Rights and demanding one. Uh, so why is it that some thought we didn't need a Bill of Rights. This is the Federalist argument. So when we say Federalists, we're not, we've talked about the ratification debate in past um, classes, but recall from the ratification debates, you know, the Federalists are those who support ratification. And so before and during the convention, these are the voices who really wanted a stronger central national government to deal with the existing problems. And so we're talking about Madison, Alexander Hamilton are the main writers of the Federalist Papers, but we're also talking about James Wilson, for instance. And Hamilton and James Wilson make, I think, the most clear arguments about why there shouldn't be a Bill of Rights. Madison also rejects it. Um, what Wilson says is, he gives a famous speech during ratification and he just, he says, well, look, I mean, First off, we have state constitutions, which either do or do not have these. So they offer protections to their citizens if they want to. But the other thing is that the constitution creates um, a federal government with limited enumerated powers. So a uh, bill of rights would imply powers that the national government doesn't have. Hamilton takes this and runs with it. So he writes um, one of the finest, final Federalist papers, Federalist 84, he takes this on. And what Hamilton says is a Bill of Rights would actually be a dangerous idea. So it's not just unnecessary, he says, it's dangerous. And he takes Wilson's argument and he goes further. He, said, he says, right, Wilson has this right. If you say we need a Bill of Rights to protect freedom of speech, it implies that Congress has power to ban speech. Hamilton says Congress absolutely does not have that power. Where is it that they have any power to ban speech, to create a national religion? to do anything like that. Where does it say that uh, you know, they have power over um, 
criminal rights or things like that, right? So Hamilton's suggestion is if you created this structure of limited enumerated powers, that structure is the Bill of Rights. That's Hamilton's argument. The structure itself, the structural constitution is what matters. And the other thing is that they point out that they pointed, they did put limitations and some rights in there, um, like habeas corpus, right? The limit on um, uh, Congress's ability to um, uh, rescind the writ of habeas corpus. So real quick, Nick, just to kind of like understand this, this big debate that they're going on at the end and through the ratification debate. So students, the constitution goes back to the states to be voted on. And if nine out of 13 states vote on it, it becomes law. So this is like, the, this is the, the crux of the fight. And so people like Hamilton are saying the structure that we put into the constitution is going to protect the individual and, not, and, and remove the power from the national government to do this. But then there's people like the dissenters, um, Jerry Randolph and um, uh, uh, Mason, Mason, kind of stuck on Mason, <laughs> that said, no, 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 you have to spell out in there what the federal government cannot do. So Derek wanted to know, was George Mason considered an anti-federalist? Yes. Good. Okay. And so, then, and yeah, then yeah. next question, as we think about this, we see you know, Madison starting off as somebody that is like, no, 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 we don't need a Bill of Rights, but he switches and he winds up writing the Bill of Rights. What, and I, next I wanna go through really quickly every single one of the amendments in the Bill of Rights so our students know what each of them are, but why does he change over? It's because he knows he's not gonna win the battle? Yeah, so why he does, there's a, I think there's a few reasons Madison changes his mind. Uh, the first thing I'll, I'll say just, mention one final part about that Federalist argument against the Bill of Rights. The, one other thing Hamilton points out, I think is actually really important because it gets to what the anti-Federalists say too, is he says, popular sovereignty. He says, look at the preamble. The people only surrendered some of their power. They retained total power. Giving them a Bill of Rights implies something that didn't happen. They didn't give up any more power than they agreed to. So the government can't assert any of this power of their rights. The federal government can. And of course, the anti-federalists are saying, well, no, I mean, uh, this is popular sovereignty resides in state governments, too, which are supposed to protect the people. They're closer to them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, their argument is that a Bill of Rights um, is necessary because if there are already some limitations in the Constitution and a smaller Bill of Rights, why not protect these other things? Why not list them? Yeah. So, so they're concerned about that, right? Well, let's start listing them. So right. the reason why I say, I know that they are sent to the states as a bundle, but they're yes. all ratified separately. Yes. And of course, states too start this process. The states that are most concerned. So the whole thing we say about ratification is a lot of states, it's really close votes. Uh, Massachusetts, Virginia, New York. A lot of these, even Pennsylvania, there's a lot of anti-federalist opposition to the Constitution. What ends up happening is that there's close votes, they okay it, but then they also demand, they make these lists, right? So they either send a list of amendments or possible demands, they, you know, they call it, uh, you know, this is, this, this is ratification, but with, you know, uh, conditions. They call it conditional ratification. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they're sending amendments or in the case of Pennsylvania, they, they have a dissent where they just they list these 20 rights that need to be protected. And so that Madison's aware of that. What Madison's most worried about is there's a movement in New York and Virginia to have a second convention. So they say, <laughs> like, no way. we don't trust what's happening. We don't think you're going to listen to us. Uh, so what we want, because the people didn't get enough of a limited government, they didn't give a bill. Right. We need a second convention. We're, we're open and honest about what we're doing because first off, they're also saying, hey, by the way, it was secret. Mm. We didn't know what they were doing. So let's have an open process. And so Madison's looking at that and he's going, okay, we got what we wanted. And uh, if we have a second convention, we have no idea where that could go. That could lead down the rabbit hole. That could lead to much greater problems. We don't want to have that. That could be a runaway. The other thing is Madison's running for office. At this mm. point, we're, you know, we're, uh, it's fall 1788. He's running for the House. Now, he can't get a Senate seat because anti-federalists actually win in Virginia. 
So they appoint anti-federal senators. He's running against James Monroe. And Madison publicly says, you know, look, I'm going to get in there and I am going to support immediately a uh, bill of rights. Huh. And so that's part of what he says. And, uh, you know, he had his friend Thomas Jefferson is writing to him. Even when Madison's in the Virginia ratif- uh, debates, ratification debates, and he's kind of arguing against Jefferson, he's getting these letters back and forth where they're talking about this. And Jefferson is saying, we need a Bill of Rights. We shouldn't ratify it without one. And Madison is very skeptical about this. But eventually what he thinks is, well, I've seen it with Patrick Henry. Maybe it can happen elsewhere. If we get a Bill of Rights, we can bring anti-federalists into the fold and we can move to a greater union. This would be a smart thing to do. Let's just make sure we get the right protections in there. I don't want all these structural changes. What he doesn't want is to reduce the power of the national government too much. He wants the Bill of Rights to look a different way. So June 1789, that first Congress, right? So pretty quickly in there, Madison does what he says he's going to do. So he introduces 17 draft amendments. The House debates them. They change some of them. And then they submit them to the Senate. And uh, the Senate um, gets rid of five of them, rewrites a whole bunch of them, sends them back to the House. Madison apparently is so devastated that he says, we, you know, we'd be better off uh, without passing what the Senate gave us, they're, they're so bad. The revisions were so bad. Uh, there's a lot of disappointment on and it, former anti-federalists who wanted this Bill of Rights. But then Madison ends up joining with Senate colleagues in a, uh, a joint committee to really basically finalize the Bill of Rights to agree on some revisions and then finally submit those to the states at the end of September. By the way, Curry, you'll recognize some of the names on that joint committee included Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth. So even in Congress, in the first Congress, if you needed um, compromise, then you needed Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth. So. Um, oh, and I love Kathy's, uh, Kath- the students were wondering about adding even more amendments and what would the 28th Amendment do? So I love Kathy's, which is about wearing a mask. That's our hypothetical today. So we're going to do this in like two minutes, Nick. Bit, you're going to give me the snapshot of every amendment we're going to fly through, and then we're going to jump to the hypothetical since Kathy brought it up in the chat. I so, think it's a great way. So two minutes, <laughs> what's the big idea of the First Amendment? Uh, so as we already looked over, we talked about, right, we talked about the freedom of conscience as, as kind of the base value. So we just think of like the basic value held within. So we're talking about the ideas, the thoughts, the beliefs within our own mind that we cannot give away to government. That's what we mean by inalienable. So this is one of those essential natural rights that's being protected. And it's doing so by listing these particular uh, rights that come out of that basic freedom, right? So we're talking about free speech. We're talking about religion, assembly and petition. Don't forget those. Um, So I think that's kind of the core of the First Amendment. Uh, The second- What's it? Yeah. Freedom to be uh, you. <laughs> the Second Amendment, um, the two components there, which is, you know, I think in a couple of weeks we'll be doing our Second Amendment so we can really uh, take a much deeper dive on the relationship between the militia clause, which is the well regulated militia being necessary to the security of free state, and then the second part, which is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, some of that language comes from that English text. So it relates, uh, at least in the Supreme Court's mind, I think, uh, to this pre-constitutional right to self-defense. So think of that as being the core value. It's self-defense, but it's a question of what that looks like in terms of what the government can and cannot do. I think that's the best way of putting it. Third Amendment, um, it's related both to the Second and to the Fourth Amendment in the sense that it could be both about privacy, but about this experience under the British uh, before the revolution of... uh, the Quartering Act in 1774 and soldiers, in fact, using uh, uh, private places in order to uh, keep their soldiers, whether or not that's an invasion of somebody's privacy, of their property rights. Um, and so that's that's the Third Amendment, right? So soldiers cannot in peacetime be forcefully kept in people's homes. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, we always talk about the James Otis story from 1761. Uh, this is, you know, the, the heart of it is the prohibition against general warrants, which is to say a general warrant means that the government goes and searches anything and everything 
and doesn't say what they're looking for or why they're looking for it. And so the heart of the Fourth Amendment is uh, if the government is going to search, it needs a good reason. It needs to say what it's looking for and why it's looking for it. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, um, the core here, I, it's hard because there's a lot here, right? Yeah. It's, it's, a lot of it is criminal defendants. Uh, I'm sorry, the rights of criminal defendants. So Curry already mentioned self-incrimination, and I think she gave you a little description there, right? Is you have the right to remain silent. You cannot talk, and that's your option. But if you do talk, then that changes things. Um, due process is in there, which is which is a very important right. So uh, double jeopardy, right? Uh, you, you can't be tried for the same crime more than once. But then also there's a property right in there, right? Which is the uh, the right that private property cannot be taken for public use without just compensation. We know this is uh, sometimes is the takings clause or eminent domain, uh, the limitations on government power to take property. Um, so that's another piece of the Fifth Amendment. Uh, Sixth Amendment, this is all uh, criminal rights. Um, so we can just kind of think of it as a list of what they thought to be the core rights of criminal defendants, the right to a speedy and public trial. So that's your jury trial right. It's also an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. That means you need to be tried by your peers, not just anybody, right? That's important. You have to be informed of the nature and the cause of the accusation. You need to know the crime you've been uh, said to have, have done. You need to understand why you're being uh, charged. You need to be confronted with witnesses against yourself. So, right, witnesses can't just say something. That's called the confrontation clause. You have the right to cross-examine, in other words, in a, in a trial. You can get witnesses in your favor. And, of course, you have the right to, to counsel as well, right? So that includes today the right for indigent uh, defendants, meaning those who cannot pay for counsel, that the state will provide them with a lawyer. You know that is public defendants. So that comes. Kind of always feels like the 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 procedures need to be fair, and that yes, it this is like, all about process, right? It's all about part, yes. fairness, and then yes. when we look at seventh, it's still connected to that, right? It grows out of it because yeah. uh, the originally in the Constitution of the Third uh, Article Three. There is a protection of the right to jury trial, but only in criminal cases. So a lot of uh, the anti-federalists and others raise concern about this says, how can we say this isn't true in, in civil trials? We need process rights there too. We need the core protection of a trial by jury. And what's um, a civil case for the students just to make sure that they understand what is so, a civil? Yeah, I mean, the, the difference here is when you sue somebody in civil court, you're not trying to put them in jail you're you're essentially trying to get your either your rights recognized or typically you're trying to get uh, financial compensation or something like that got it right? okay just so. To, so it's clear to everybody now eighth amendment one of my favorites and i know that sounds weird but i find it so interesting eighth amendment is about cruel and unusual punishment it's and this also has process in it too right because excessive bail is important and that's an old right too right you can't impose excessive bail or excessive fines uh, but not cruel and unusual punishments. And I'm sure it's your favorite in part because it's it's a hard amendment precisely because that language itself is so, I don't know, ethereal. Um, it's <laughs> it's kind of hard to put your finger on, right? Yeah. It's more it's the language of morality, not the language of law. Is what, yeah. how I put it. You're right. And that's probably absolutely why I love it. And I also think it's a shapeshifter. Yes. So depending on how we define what is cruel and unusual, it, it, it to me seems like it really does change with people's perspectives too. So it, it, we, I, lawyers might call it the language of common law as opposed to the language of fundamental law, which is yeah. something yeah. like that. So yeah, it's, it, that one's a, hard, a little harder because it, it is, there's moral language there. The Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment, uh, our scholar Kurt Lash likes to, to remind us that uh, popular sovereignty gets put in here uh, we did that with the 27th Amendment, so I'll throw that in here too, right? So when you read the Ninth Amendment, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by, quote, the people. Go back to what I said about Hamilton, right? And this notion that under popular sovereignty, the people only gave away certain powers to the government. And that means powers and rights otherwise not granted are retained by the people. That is a popular sovereignty provision in that sense, so we often think of it as maybe being connected to natural rights, and I think that's a smart way to read it too, but also pay attention to the text, right? 
because popular sovereignty and natural rights, Curry, you know this when you talk about this, they go together. So don't yep. act like they can't work together. The 10th Amendment, read that the same way, right? It mentions the people. Yes, it's about the states and the federal government and reserving certain powers to the states that are not given away. But again, who ultimately ratified the Constitution and gave up power? The states states. are important, but it's the people, popular sovereignty. So you see that end reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So power to the people or power to the states. Yes. So the reservation goes that arrow points more than one direction. But Mm -hmm. it really is saying, of course, that they're a reminder that the federal government is a government of limited enumerated powers and that rights of is not granted by the people or to their states who are also representatives of the people um, are retained. And this is what I find so fascinating. So at this time period, we have to remember some of their biggest fears is this oh oh, too powerful national government. So, so many of these amendments in this time period are pulling back and saying, you can only, you have power in that constitution, but it's limited. And that's what you see is this theme in the bill of rights, protecting the individual, from this national government and making sure that the national government knows it doesn't have all inclusive power, which is very different when we jump to the 1860s and look at the reconstruction amendments. Very, very different. And we'll do those in another class students and we can send you the links to those in the wrap up this week. But I know we are officially out of time. I just wanna leave our students in the hypothetical that Kathy brought up as a possible 28th amendment And some of the things that have gone on around the First Amendment in this year were around, could you assemble? Could you get together with more than 50 people in your state? Um, And that's peaceably assembling, going to say church, which is also a part of that First Amendment. But can the people band together over 50 people? And if the governor says no, does that violate the First Amendment's protection of freedom of assembly? So I'm gonna leave students with that kind of hypothetical And we are going to end the class for today. Um, I'm gonna do two things. Number one, put it in the chat so you can think about it. And next time we chat, we can talk about it. Or if you have some time to hang out with us after class, we can chat about it then. But with that, we are gonna close class for today. Nick, thanks for a fun class today. That was super fast, but really, really fun. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna do.